Thank you. Chair now recognizes Ms. Mace from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Califf, uh, thank you for being here today, and thank you for your work on scheduling reform and your recommendation that cannabis should be moved to Schedule 3. While I and many cannabis advocates believe this does not go far enough, this is a long overdue start. So my first question today is I understand this issue now rests with the DEA, um, and I'm cur curious if you have an update on the timing of their decision. Now, you... We're both from South Carolina. We know, we, you know, I can't, I don't even know, but if I did, I couldn't tell you anyway. So the timing of a regulatory decision is something that would be up to the DEA, not up to me. We think it'll happen this year, or have any idea? I, I know that um, there's no reason for DEA to delay. I think they just have to take into account all the regulations that are in play. Okay, thank you. If the DEA concurs with the FDA's recommendation, um, can you help me understand that the FDA will take any take on additional responsibilities or if your role will change as it relates to cannabis? I, this is a very complicated topic, but I'll just say that um, cannabis, you know, remember there are over 30 different forms of cannabis now, different chemicals that mm -hmm. are made, and it falls in this area where state regulation has been um, dominant. Um, this is an area where I believe we would be better off if we had guidance from Congress about how to proceed, um, because we're not, uh, medical marijuana is one thing where there's a medical purpose and it's proven through traditional medical pathways, but when it's used for recreational purposes, um, there is no medical benefit in that case, it, so it doesn't fall under our typical regulation. But what's in play with this and several other things that I think we'll probably talk with the chairman about here shortly like CBD, the question is, how do we reduce harm that's done when it's used inappropriately or at a dose which is dangerous mm -hmm. or when it's uh, packaged in a way to market it specifically to children? We're seeing uh, some of this stuff packaged in gummy bears that um, easily mistaken for children's <laughs> candy. But we're going to need help in a, in a regulatory pathway, remembering that mo almost everything we do is there's a health benefit, like you create a new drug or a new device or a food for a health benefit. This is an area of harm reduction when it's used recreationally. Um, right. Well, and also, I mean, it reduces the, the morbidity and the addiction to opioids prescribed by doctors, too. I mean, there's a, just a, amount, a huge amount of benefit. I've seen it benefit benefited in my own life, and welcome to my world. I'm a mom of teenage kids. I've seen packaging of things. I see what kids are bringing to school, even in a state that prohibits cannabis. Kids are doing it um, all over the place. Um, and I have a bill called the States Reform Act. Um, it puts, uh, it, there's a balance between federal regulation and also regulation amongst the states, but one of the things you mentioned was about packaging. Uh, myself, and like my colleagues, were concerned about the safeguards for our youth, and one of the, the things in the States Reform Act is it addresses uh, the packaging that should not be marketed like it's candy or a candy bar or chips or whatever kind of candy is your favorite. Um, in South Carolina, I understand these product products, uh, so I'm concerned about safeguards for youths and intoxicating hemp-derived products. So in in South Carolina, these products are not age-gated or appropriately tested, and many of the packages do resemble candy or snacks and uh, that sort of thing. And so it's a, it, for my family, it's an ongoing conversation about what looks cool and looks like it might be a fun and exciting, really is not, especially on a young brain. Without revealing too much about my age, I'm a child of the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> so it would be nice if in my lifetime mm -hmm. we came up with a regulatory scheme where I think America, you know, whatever your belief is about use of the product, where uh, these safety issues that you've referred to are written into law so that we have a scheme whereby we can uh, regulate it. Because if it's not written into law, then we're, as I said, we're referees. You write the rules. Um, we need the right rule book in order to play uh, the referee role. I would encourage you and I would love for you to review the States Reform Act, a bill that I wrote uh, last session that, that takes into account the, you know, the regulatory side and the federal side, but also states being in the driver's seat, but one of, again, one of the, the, the impositions in the bill is addressing uh, and ensuring that we don't market to kids. 
things aren't packaged to children and that sort of thing. Um, and then I only have 20 seconds left. Um, while I firmly support the right of Americans to make choices about what to put in their body, we can all agree it is a desirable outcome for less people to smoke cigarettes and the negative health effects of which are well known. Um, any comment on alternative uh, non-nicotine products today while you're here in five seconds or less? Well, there, all right, so yeah, there are several categories. Uh, medications is one category where I hope we'll see more in the pipeline. It's not robust. When it comes to chemicals that are synthesized that also cause, activate nicotine receptors, they also cause addiction to nicotine. So um, we've got a, um, and, and the inventiveness of entrepreneurs in this area is profound right now because chemistry has gotten so much better. So there's some things I'm very concerned about in non- uh, tobacco, nicotine, and even compounds that are one, one component removed from nicotine, which may even be more potent in terms of addiction. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Italy.